The profit was $2,151. Not bad. Not bad. That's good. I said thank you for all your work and donations. And again, in the back there's a, uh, a detailed account of what, what was spent and what, what was collected. All right. Anything else before we start? We covered it. <laughs> we covered it. Right. Praise the Lord. Yes, thank you. All right. Well, if we covered it, then why don't we uh, rise and begin our worship? We're going to sing Amazing Grace by James DeGraw, and that's found in your folder.
according to the word of God in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us therefore confess our sin before God and before one another. Most merciful God, I confess that I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what I have done and by what I have left undone. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. Therefore I come before your throne of grace, that I may receive mercy and find grace to help in every kind of need. Forgive me, renew me, and lead me, so that I may enlighten your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, who gives the power to become the children of God, and who stows all men, his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, God, we have celebrated with joy the festival of our Lord's resurrection. Graciously help us to show the power of his resurrection in all that we say and do. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And the lesson for today is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. And I'm actually going to begin with the 16th verse. And the evangelist Matthew writes the following about the Holy Spirit. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain in which Jesus had directed them. And when they, saw, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded them. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this word we ask that as we hear what you have for us today, that you would open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts to all that you're saying to us, and that your word be planted deeply in our heart, bear fruit for eternal life, and be a blessing not only to ourselves, but to all that we need. And now, Lord, I pray that the word of my mouth and meditation of our hearts would be truly acceptable in your sight, our strength and our humor. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. As we come to the Gospel of Matthew, we are told here that after our Lord Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples gathered at a mountain that was an appointed place where they were to meet after his resurrection in Galilee. And he said the following. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of of the age. Now, what we find here in these couple of verses is so filled with meaning and importance that we can't possibly get to it all in one sermon. But there are certain things that we see here that we really do need to take into our hearts and act upon if as a congregation and as individuals we are to be obedient stewards of what God has given us through the risen Jesus by the Holy Spirit. So what do we see here that we need to take with us so that we can do the work of the kingdom after we leave? First thing we see is that Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given 
to me. Because Jesus is raised from the dead, his name is now above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no greater person, there is no greater name than the person and name of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is in complete divine charge of your life, my life, our present, our past, and our future. It's very important that we see this. He is in charge. And because he's in charge, because he has all authority, he gives us a command. A command that's not an opinion. A command that, that we're, not, we're not allowed to just reject or argue with. He says this. He says, go. Go. What does that mean? It means don't sit there. Don't stand around. You know that he's alive. You know what he's done for you. Don't just sit there with that news on your hands. Don't sit there and just contemplate it. But you need to get up and go and share this news with the entire <coughs> world. The fact that Jesus is alive is the most important piece of news that anyone will ever receive. Far more important than anything you're going to see in the newspaper. Far more important than anything else you're going to have. Far more important than any inheritance you might receive on earth. This is the most important news that you will ever get. Because the fact that he lives means that forgiveness is available. That God is willing to take us back and make us children. And that his wrath has been taken care of. And if we believe in Jesus, we have eternal life. We have a new creation. We have a totally new and great future awaiting for us. We have the inheritance of the saints in light we will reign with Christ when he comes again. Because he lives, we know that the power of sin, death, and the devil has been conquered. And those who are in bondage to darkness, those who are in bondage to addictions, those who are in bondage to all sorts of depression and despair, or in bondage to the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they can be released right now and set free to have the joy of heaven in their hearts that will never die if they will receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. There is nothing more important than this news. Jesus is telling his disciples, you have got to get going on this because you have friends, you have neighbors, you have the whole world that is dying in the dark, oppressed by the devil, consumed by their sin, and the only way out is through Jesus Christ. The only way to be refreshed, to find healing, cleansing, and the new birth is through Jesus Christ. This is not something we can just keep to ourselves. This is something that people need to know about. Will everyone believe it? No. Will everyone uh, accept it? No. Will everyone like it when they hear it? No. I remember when I, I first got saved and I was so excited about what Jesus had done and people were looking at me like I was a lunatic because I was sharing him all the time. This is what Jesus did. Isn't it great? Shut up and stop the shoves. <laughs> I, but here's the thing. It doesn't matter. What matters is that they're hearing the word. They're hearing the invitation. We need to share that. Because Jesus says, no, this is terribly important. Because there is a time coming when he will judge the living and the dead. There is a time coming when the wrath of God will be manifested completely on the earth. And if people want to be set free from the coming wrath, they need to get Jesus and get saved. And so this is news that we need to share. Don't sit on it. If you've met the Lord, you have the responsibility of sharing with people. And that doesn't mean that you have to run to Africa to share it. Because in the truth, we got family members that need to hear it. We got neighbors who don't know. I mean, we have a whole community here 
I mean, if you look at the news, we've got a whole nation here that needs to be revived and evangelized and set free. So let's, let's focus on the people around us. That's your mission for you. Speak to them about what Jesus has done, the truth of his word, his power to save. Let people know. Jesus says, go. Do it. Because he's desperate to save souls. But now, after he says, go, he says this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. Disciples. You know, that's a specific term. And it's important that we understand what it means. Because when he says, go and make disciples, he is not simply saying, go and put somebody on the membership roll of your congregation. It's not just about making church members. It's about making people who will follow the Lord Jesus Christ. People who are totally, absolutely committed to doing what they have seen their Lord do. Saying what they have heard their Lord say and acting for the kingdom in their lives. You see, one of the things we need to, we need to get out of is this mindset that, okay, our job as a congregation is to fill the church. It would be wonderful to fill this church. It would be great, right? Love to see it. Certainly like to hear a few more voices singing. It would be awesome. <laughs> but you know what? You know what? If all they're doing is being on the roll, but they have no heart for Jesus, then what good was it doing? For them, what good was it? Jesus is not calling us to be simple and few sinners. He's not calling us to be on a roll in a church somewhere, per se. Although, let me say right now, if you're a believer, you need to be with the gathering. You do. But what he's calling us to is more than just having our name on a roll in the church. We need to be followers of Jesus, committed to him, sharing with him, living for him, observing what he has said and doing it. You know, one of the things that we need are Bible-believing, Spirit-filled, committed Christians to be doing the work of the kingdom. Let me tell you right now, there are lots of people filling lots of churches. And just because you're sitting in that pew doesn't mean you're a committed Christian. I'm not pointing fingers, but I'm just talking about a poll that was recently done. And I'm not, I'm not even going to go with the main line churches because we all know how you know, we're having a, a hard time in the main line churches <coughs> with faith in general. <coughs> but even in, even in what you would think would be, quote, safe, Bible-believing churches. <coughs> I remember one time, they did a poll, and even, even in churches like the Missouri Senate, or an evangelical church, you realize that almost half the people did not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They did not believe that you needed to believe in Him to be saved. Well, if you don't believe in Him, you need to believe in Him to be saved. Why are you there? Why? Why not go to the movies? So, it's a problem. You can have people in the views, build up, but if they're not committed to doing the work of the kingdom, they're not getting all they need, and the church isn't doing what it needs. So Jesus is saying, you need to make disciples. Just as you're hot for God, they need to be hot for God. Just, just as you're trying to follow the word, you need to teach them to follow the word. You need to show them how. The church has to be a place where people are made disciples. Not just coming on Sunday and then going off and living like the world. Disciples. And that's a lifelong process for all of us. But we need to make disciples. And then he goes on to say this. He shows us what a disciple looks like. There are two qualifications. He says, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, 
Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded. Okay, so first, if you're really a disciple of Jesus, what are you going to do? Get baptized. You're going to get baptized. Now that may seem obvious to us, but the fact of the matter is that there are whole congregations who make it a point of having people accept Jesus as their Lord and their Savior in their hearts, but they miss that step of baptism. They don't think it's very important. In fact, there's one, one group that I heard about from a missionary where they, 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 don't, they don't actually tell people they need to be baptized. They got to do a lot of other things, but they don't need to be baptized. Now, let me say right now, if Jesus commanded us to be baptized, and a disciple is someone that follows the word of Jesus. Well then, if you're a disciple, you're going to get yourself to wherever you need to get to get baptized. So, the first thing we need to see is that baptism in water is not optional. If you're a disciple, you're going to be baptized because we find very clearly in Scripture that baptism is the entry point whereby we are joined to the death of Jesus so that his death is our death and we're joined to the blessings of the cross where what he did for us now avails for us because now we're in the covenant and it's also the place where we receive the Holy Spirit so that we can rise in resurrection life to serve him. There's never a time in the Bible never a time in the Bible where somebody says, well, be baptized or not. No, but just be baptized. Baptism is an essential step in everyone's Christian life. And if you haven't been baptized, then get baptized. It's an essential step. Now somebody will say, well, Pastor, are you saying that you can't get to heaven if you're not baptized? Well, let me say right now, I hate that question. The reason I hate that question is when somebody says, are you saying you can't get to heaven unless you're baptized? What they're really saying is, I don't want you baptized. Then you don't want to obey the Lord. And if you are, in fact, intentionally not obeying the Lord, then I wouldn't want to meet him on, on the judgment day. With that attitude. I really wouldn't. But, are there exceptions to that rule? I can think of one. And that is the thief who was on the cross who accepted Jesus right before he died. And you know why he's the exception? Because they weren't going to take him off the cross so he could be baptized. So yes, ultimately it is faith, but real faith will lead you to baptism. So please understand, the exception actually proves the rule. If you were able to, he could then baptize. So, baptism is very important. Let's not skip on that. If anybody's led to Christ, get baptized. And you don't need to wait a month before you get baptized. You can do it right away. But get baptized. Now, the second thing that we find is that after baptism, Jesus says, teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. So, in other words, what we're to do is to make disciples, and what we do is we teach them, after the baptized, we teach them to observe everything Jesus says in the Old and the New Testament. Everything. And observe, by the way, does not mean just sitting in a pew and listening and not doing. Because this is not philosophy class. It's listening and then learning how to do what Jesus said. And what that also says to the church, something very important. If we are to make disciples, then what we need to do is share with others what's called a biblical worldview. In, in other words, we need to share the Bible with them. What the Bible says, what Jesus says in the Bible, and, and, and why that's important. And to encourage them to live that out 
And that requires us as the church to share it all. Not just those things that the world likes. Not just those things that, that people can generally agree on. But we need to share those things that the world hates. But nevertheless, you have to do them. You need to observe them. Because that's what it is to be a disciple. And to show the world the kingdom that's coming. For example, all right, it, we, we, can, we can teach people, we can teach people that we are to take care of the poor and the needy. And, and the world will be just fine with that. Okay? That part's not hard. Look at that. But as soon as you start teaching, yeah, you know, you need to be married to one man and one woman, and you need to stay married, and you also need to bring your kids up in purity and holiness. Then all of a sudden, it's like, what? Or, or, if you start talking about things like forgiveness, everybody's willing to, to agree that we need to forgive until we're the ones offended. And then we have a hard time with that teaching, don't we? Because we're angry. And yet we need to teach people how to live in forgiveness. Not just think about it, do it. There are a lot of things that Jesus teaches that will be an offense to the world, and yet we need to walk that out in our lives and not worry about what the world thinks. That's what it means to be a disciple. So understand that when we are teaching, when we're preaching, when we have Bible studies, when, when we have special meetings, one of the things that's going on there is people are being taught how to live in a biblical worldview, how to live as Jesus has taught us to live. It's very important. And it's the Word of God. Jesus says, Teach them to observe everything I've commanded. In other words, do it. Don't just think about it. Put it in practice. You know, practicing Christian. People will say, well, you know, sometimes I don't get it right, but you know, that's why we're always practicing. We're practicing Christians. We may not get it right all the time, but we're going to keep trying. And by the grace of God, by the Holy Spirit, we are going to succeed. But we need to practice. We need to practice love. We need to practice forgiveness. We need to practice holiness. We need to practice everything that the Lord has put in our midst. And then we'll be disciples. And you know what his great promise is? That as we practice his word, he says, And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So, in other words, as we practice His Word, as we live according to His Word, we're going to see great things. You know why? Because He's going to confirm His Word. He's not going to confirm your ideas or my ideas. He's not going to confirm what the world says. But He is going to confirm His Word in you. And as people see His power working in you, they're going to see Him. And they're going to be saved. Or at least they're going to be presented with the message. So today, let's remember that God has called us through the risen Jesus to be a people on the move. We are to go and share with those around us the good news of Jesus Christ. And we're to make disciples, not just church members. And those disciples do the will of God. They're committed to Him. And if they're going to be disciples, then we need to make sure that they're baptized. Baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the way they enter into the covenant. That's the way that we see the resurrection life. There is an exchange that happens there in baptism. And then also, we're to teach. Teach what? Teach how it is that we apply the Word of God to our lives in every situation so that we are walking in a biblical worldview and not in a worldly worldview. Because it's the biblical worldview living in you that the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit is going to confirm through miracles, wonders, and signs. Through the power of His love working in your life, touching others. 
Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for this opportunity to hear your word. Lord, let it grow us. And Lord, I pray that, that as we are disciples, that you would provide us divine appointments to share what we know about you with others. And that they might receive you and be taught and grow in the face of God. And that they would also see your power at work in their lives and what they do. And that that would encourage them to continue walking in the Bible. Lord, there's much work that needs to be done and you've sent us into the nature. Grant us, Lord, your grace. The harvest, the harvest is there. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we'll sing, uh, what hymn are we singing? Okay, 153, that's in the uh, folder? Yeah. Okay, that's in the folder. Cause in us, Lord, by your spirit, by your grace, 
to live out a biblical worldview so that people may see the kingdom of God and your righteousness living in us by your spirit, and they may turn to you and live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our right. prayers. Lord Jesus, you've commanded us to pray for our nation, so we ask you to forgive our, forgive our nation for the shedding of innocent blood. Forgive our nation, Lord, for rejecting uh, the order of creation with regards to male and female in marriage. Forgive us, Lord, for bitterness, rage, anger, hatred, jealousy, unforgiveness, and unbelief. For idolatry, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. Forgive us, Lord, for seeking first our own pleasures rather than the kingdom of heaven. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, I ask in your mercy that you would cleanse us by your blood, that you would bring the Holy Spirit awakening to our nation, let it begin in the churches. Burn out the root branch of compromise and sin in the church, that we may shine like the sun. Lord, gather up the remnant of your church and place them in Bible believing and spirit filled churches. And Lord, break the power of darkness that seeks to blind the eyes of the people of God so that we may see the truth, repent, live for you. And as we live for you, Holy Spirit, confirm the word of Jesus through miracles, wonders, and signs. That our communities will come to know Jesus and turn to him and live. And Lord, bring salvation to our president, vice president, senate, house, Supreme court, our governor, state legislators, state, local, and federal officials and judges. Lord, where they're right, sustain them. Where they're wrong, grant them the spirit of grace and supplication to recognize their wrong. Moreover, their sin is for an only son. Throw all their iniquities to freeze into the fire and burn them forever. And establish policies that are pleasing in your sight and the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, we also pray that you would raise up righteous men and women, Josephs and Daniels, filled with the wisdom of God to be in the government places, that that wisdom would guide things and bring, Lord, a blessing to the nation and not curse. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus, you commanded us to pray uh, for the people of Israel, Lord, we pray your protection upon them, we pray, Lord, your peace and righteousness to Jerusalem, let now be the time when you grant your people Israel a spirit of grace and supplication to recognize you, the one who they pierce, mourn over you as for only son, and be cleansed by your blood, filled with your spirit, join in your church as the one who man. Be with your congregations of Israel, the Lord. Grant them the grace to preach your word with power, while you lift up your hand to heal miracles, wonders, and signs of Thank you, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, hear our prayers. Lord, you are the healer by your stripes and healed. Thank you for that. And we pray the healing that you purchase on Calvary's Hill. In the lives of Roger Robles, Aspen Heisman, Ed Werner, Jacqueline Van Sweet, Bryce Johnson, Robert Empty, Jerry Rosecrans, Ben Vesterson, Janine Wesley, Marilyn Morstead, Bruce Tilt, Helen Beck, Doug Sorry, Oliver Sorry, Kathy Schaefer, Douglas Hurstman, Rupa Kahara, Monica Parks, Dorothy Johnson, Diana Kafar, Barry James Lovering, Joe Freitag, Carol Resendez, Josie Yuki, Norman Vanderpan, Doug Hasselton, Laurel Erickson, Rose Wakeworth, Sandy Cronin, Creola Lundquist, Jayla Johnson, jo uh, Joanne Lerotoso, Gordon Cowell, Stephanie Hoisted, Ruthie Overbolt, Pablo Lindloff, Scott Russo, Stephanie Bonell, Darren Gray, Kevin Corbin. We pray too for our military personnel, Lord Michael Rasmussen, Shane Gano, Patrick O'Malley, Kayla Dyer, Kevin and Eliza McKenzie, <coughs> Scott Barb Riley, Trevor Simmons. Jonathan Defoe, Isaiah Burr, David Burr, Sandy Meese, Riley Legacy, and Harvey Hankin. And we pray your blessing on all those we mention now that are out loud or in our hearts. Captain Arlene Hawkins. Yes. I pray for the brothers and sisters at Gilgit and Andrea Sandstrom. And Lord, I also want to pray for a young couple. They want to keep their names private, but they, they uh, want to have a baby and they're uh, unable, have been unable to so far. And I just ask for the healing wherever it's needed there, Lord, that they will 
have a uh, healthy and well yes. baby that will grow to come and love and serve you, Lord. Praise, yes. praise God. Yes, thank you. Thank for Jim Spryant and, and for Lee Johnson and all the rest of the struggle soldiers that are all over the world. Yes, Lord. Yes. Thank you. Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, you are our prayers. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all of whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for your sight. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Peace in the Lord be with you always. Also with you. Let's share that peace with one another. <laughs>